What is up, you guys? Welcome to another edition of Controversial Thoughts. On last week's episode, I did a short video on the carnivore diet for beginners. Uh, this week, I wanted to talk a little bit about the plant toxicity spectrum in more detail because I got a lot of questions about that when I posted it on Instagram. So as I discussed last week in the Controversial Thoughts video, a basic carnivore diet for beginners is meat and organs. I talked about the macro proportions and I talked about salt and I talked about which organs. I talked about all that last week. So if that's interesting for you, go back to last week's Controversial Thoughts. One of the things that I find very interesting as well is that there is some room for individuality here. And I'm quite intrigued by the possibility of a carnivore-ish type diet for a lot of people. That might be something like a tier one or two carnivore diet. If you've read my book, The Carnivore Code, all of these diets are going to include meat and organs as the majority of the diet, but there is some room for including plants for color, variety, texture, or if you wanna have different macros. I've been messing around with carbohydrates a little bit, which makes me think if I'm going to eat plants, are there some plants that are more or less toxic? If you've heard me on other podcasts, there are three main points to a carnivore diet that I talk about, an animal-based diet in general. Number one, animal meat and organs are the center of the human diet and have been for millions of years of human evolution. And including these in our diet is essential for human health, integral to kicking a lot of ass. They have been incorrectly vilified for the last 70 years based on bad science, epidemiology, which is quite misleading. I've done a controversial thoughts on why epidemiology is misleading in the past. Number two, the plants that we're eating exist on a spectrum of toxicity. This is commonly known throughout indigenous cultures and hunter gatherers. They don't all eat plants without some consideration of what plant they're eating or which part of the plant they're eating. And when they eat parts of plants that are toxic, they often go to great lengths to detoxify these. So plants exist on a toxicity spectrum. If you are not thriving, understanding this and eliminating the most toxic plants, the most toxic parts of plants will probably result in much greater health, whether that's improvements in skin, GI, libido, mood, body composition, or other autoimmune issues. This I think is very important and ancestrally informed. The third thing is something that's common to all of you if you've been following my work recently, which is that seed oils, corn, canola, safflower, sunflower, soybean, peanut, grapeseed are really evolutionarily inconsistent. I love thinking about this from a species appropriate diet for humans. What is evolutionarily consistent and what is not? And I like thinking about the fact that seed oils are not evolutionarily consistent. I've done multiple podcasts, Chris Kenobi, no relation to Obi-Wan, Tucker Goodrich, Peter from Hyperlipid, Brad Marshall, Ben Bickman, many others, many other controversial thoughts videos about what the mechanisms are behind why seed oils are so toxic. Certainly excess sugars, probably toxic for humans because we just overconsume them. We have no satiety mechanism around high fructose corn syrup or other sugars. And we know in humans that if you overeat, you get excess calories, the body does a bunch of negative things. It's not so much that sugar per se is bad, but that it's very easy to overconsume it because there are lots of free living cultures that I've talked about in the past, the Hadza, the Mbuti, many cultures like this that include honey in their diet, but don't have any metabolic issues. So things like honey, they're sugar. Yeah, they're composed of sugar. If you don't overeat sugar, it's probably not bad for you, but I wouldn't eat processed sugar. If you wanna include seasonal fruit or honey in your diet, I think it's probably great for a lot of people, but see how you respond to it. Certainly not if you are already metabolically broken. In that case, a ketogenic diet or a low carb diet is gonna be essential while you correct what is causing the underlying metabolic dysfunction. As you know from my previous conversation, specifically one with Ben Bickman, again, all of these are listed guys at heartandsoil.co under the learn tab, all the videos, all the podcasts are there, all the show notes are there. Um, you're gonna hear the conversation with Ben Bickman that it's big fat cells that appear to be driving metabolic dysfunction and one of the ways we get big fat cells is by eating way too much polyunsaturated fats. I've talked about this in the past. I'll have another podcast with Peter from Hyperlipid forthcoming. All of that considered, if we are going to eat plants, what are the more and less toxic plants and parts of plants? There is some discussion of this in my book, The Carnivore Code, which you can see right there behind me. And there will be more discussion of this in the future, but I wanted to lay it out for people here. I'm developing a graphic that will be very easy to see with this in the very near future. And I'll share that widely um, at heartandsoil.co as well. So if you think about things as a plant does, put your plant, put your plant, put yourself in a plant's shoes, which might just be the plant roots, 
And you realize that after 450 to 500 million years of coevolution with animals, you don't want your roots, stems, leaves, or seeds, which is seeds, grains, nuts, and legumes to be eaten, especially not your seeds. I think seeds are some of the most toxic parts of plants. This is widely known. And these are seeds, nuts, grains, and legumes. How many people have improvements in GI issues and other health issues when they cut out seeds of all types? A paleolithic diet says nuts and seeds are okay. I think this is completely wrong and I disagree with it. They're all plant seeds. They're all the proverbial baby Moses being placed on the river. They're very susceptible, except plants have packaged around baby Moses, a bunch of chemical ninjas, a bunch of digestive enzyme inhibitors, a bunch of oxalates and phytic acid, a bunch of toxins to prevent animals from over consuming plant seeds. Really, you want to avoid seeds in your diet as much as you can. These are seeds, nuts, grains, and legumes. Beans, super problematic for humans. All kinds of issues. Lectins, kidney beans, these cause massive GI distress. If they're not fully cooked, you really need to cook the crap out of these foods to make them edible for humans. Some of them have been used in the last few thousand years, but when they are, they're very widely cooked and fermented and detoxified. If you wanna make them a part of your diet, you can if you don't react, but I would be very careful with these. And I think they're quite toxic for humans. Maybe white rice is okay for humans, but you wanna soak it, sprout it, cook the heck out of it. And I think there are less toxic foods for humans. So seeds on the toxic side of the plant spectrum, seeds, nuts, grains, legumes, cut them out, send me an email, Dr. Paul at heartandsoil.co. Tell me how much you feel better and I'll give you an electronic high five because you will. What else do plants not want to get eaten? Leaves, stems, and roots. Leaves, kale, spinach, chard, not in the plant's best interest to have these get eaten. They're full of plant defense chemicals as well. Isothiocyanates, things like sulforaphane. I talked about this on Rogan. I've talked about this many times. These are plant defense chemicals, very clearly. We are all wrong in thinking these chemicals are good for us. I think that we have forgotten about the intrinsic side effects of these exogenous molecules and over-celebrated their benefits, which are often redundant if we are doing things like environmental hormesis, heat, cold, exercise, sunlight, which appear to give us plenty of glutathione. Plant molecules are a fairy tale in their benefits for humans. In otherwise healthy individuals, I don't think they give any benefit. And individuals who are not healthy, if you can show a benefit to plant molecules, great, but what are the side effects of those plant molecules that you're ignoring? And those plant molecules are not correcting the root cause, which is often the wrong types of seed oils, overconsumption of calories, nutrient deficiencies, et cetera. Correct the root cause. Don't use plant molecules as a Band-Aid. So leaves, not a good source of things for humans, not caloric, really not that nutritionally available. Many things in there prevent the absorption of minerals and other vitamins in those foods. So plant leaves, plant seeds, toxic, plant bark, we don't eat a lot of plant bark, but you might think about things like cinnamon. Not a huge fan of cinnamon as a spice. Sure, it has maybe some data with blood sugar regulation, but it's not a good thing. And it has other chemicals called coumarins, which are toxic for humans. So avoid plant bark. And then roots. When you look at indigenous cultures, they're not a huge fan of roots. As I've talked about multiple times, the Hadza will stock digging for roots when animal foods are available. They're a fallback food. They're probably a little less toxic than the other parts of the plant. But if other foods are available, why eat them? Some people might be able to tolerate sweet potatoes. I don't tolerate them at all. They have oxalates. They have other digestive enzyme issues, inhibitors, problems with roots in general. There's also very highly toxic roots out there like cassava, which has hydrocyanic acid. When linamarin combines with um, linamarase, cassava is totally toxic unless you grind it up, leave it to dry so that all the hydrocyanic acid can be fermented. So there's a lot of toxic roots out there, a lot of very, very toxic roots. Maybe some are okay. In general, though, I think they're best avoided and I think there are better sources of food for humans in the plant kingdom. So that's the basic conceptualization of the toxic foods. But I also want you guys to consider that there are some families of foods that extend beyond that that appear to be immunogenic for most humans. High oxalate foods, including fruits, some fruits in general, but generally high oxalate foods, turmeric, rhubarb, spinach. We talked about most of those in the other plant food categories already, but what about things like the nightshades? This Solanaceae family of plants is pretty immunogenic. Tomatoes, bell peppers, peppers, chili peppers, not that great for humans. There are experiments which show that at least in cell culture, which is not perfect, but interesting, you can see that the cell culture model of the epithelium of the gut of a human is opened, meaning the transepithelial electrical gradient increases as these capsicum or Solanaceae spices or fruits are added to the cell culture, which means leaky gut 
appears to happen when you eat nightshades and especially things like chili peppers and capsicum spices, paprika, hot peppers that are a part of this Solanaceae family. So I would avoid those as well. So we have high oxalate foods, nuts, seeds, grains, legumes, roots, seeds, and stems and bark. So what's left? Not a whole lot, but a few things which make a carnivore-ish diet way more doable for a lot of people. So what part of a plant does a plant actually want to have you consume? Generally, it's the fruit. So fruit is not available all year round, but seasonally and certain times of the year, even in the equatorial regions, different fruits are available. So yes, the Hadza eat honey. That's not even really a plant food. It's more of an animal food, but you could split hairs there. But they also eat berries and baobab fruit, probably less toxic. And they're going to eat meat and organs, which we've talked about. And so for us, I think most people are going to do okay with seasonal fruit. I prefer berries. If you do okay with apples, oranges, that kind of stuff, great. I don't really like it as much, but berries are okay for me occasionally. I try and cycle them in terms of season. As we're going into fall and winter now, kind of moving away from berries, moving away from fruit, moving more towards something like a squash. And when you think about it, there are many non-sweet fruits that are actually fruit that we think of as vegetables traditionally, things like avocado, olives, and squash. In the past, acorn squash triggered the return of my eczema. I don't think other squash do it as much. Right now, I've been playing around with a little bit of butternut squash cooked in a pressure cooker. We'll see how that goes. I don't need a ton, maybe 100 grams of carbohydrates a day from that right now. But I'm focusing on the least toxic plant foods because I do feel a little better with carbohydrates in my diet, at least on a cyclic basis. Not massive amounts, but I've played around at this point with honey, fruit, and squash. Again, these are, I consider to be ancestrally consistent, evolutionarily consistent plant foods that might add on to a diet of meat and organs. Again, they're sweet and non-sweet fruits. Intuitively, we can imagine they would be less likely to have lots of problems. If I eat too much fiber, I don't feel great, so I don't avoid that. But berries, honey, squash, seems to be okay for me now. White rice, mm, not so great for me. I've had other people, clients included, who said they started eating white rice again. Itchiness came back, autoimmune issues came back. So white rice not be, might not be completely benign for all people, or maybe we're not cooking it, sprouting it, and really getting rid of that enough. Certainly not brown rice, because it has arsenic in the hull, which is removed in the white rice. So in terms of least toxic plant foods, which is really the question that everybody wants to know, I'm thinking of fruit. I'm thinking of fruit and honey. And the fruit can be a variety of things, whatever you like, maybe eat it seasonally, maybe not, see how your body does. Or what about non-sweet fruit? Avocado, olives maybe, or squash. I like to pressure cook it to get rid of anything that might be in there that's not gonna play with my body very well. So those are some options in terms of the plant toxicity spectrum. Hopefully that's helpful for you guys and gives you a sense. It makes sense to me. Um, I'm curious for your comments. I'm curious to see what you think. I think there is an ancestral origin. There is an anthropologic basis for this based on what free living hunter gatherers eat, what might be available in the wild. You can imagine that if there's a gourd, if there's a kabocha squash or a pumpkin or a butternut squash, you're going to harvest that in the fall. You might have that through the winter. These things stick around. They're very storable. They are used at different times of the year in indigenous cultures. Berries, generally seasonal. Other fruit, kind of seasonal. Depending where you are in terms of latitude, honey might be available sometimes of the year more than others. Definitely there is cycling of carbohydrate sources. Tubers, I think, are a fallback food. Maybe some are okay. Generally not going to play well with most people. See what works for you. Don't feel great with them personally. But that's the toxicity spectrum. I think that if you make animal meat and organs the center of your diet, and if you can't get the fresh organs, use desiccated organs. We've got you covered at hardensoil.co right now. Uh, you can get lifeblood. You can get histamine and immune. Beef organs coming back real soon. Fire service coming back soon. We got immunomilk, which is a colostrum supplement coming out for people that tolerate dairy and are interested in the immunoglobulin rich colostrum. And we've got one called Heart of the Warrior, which is heart and liver coming out very soon. If you can get fresh organs, that's amazing. But if you can't, desiccated organs work great. For a lot of people, we hear it from people every day that are benefiting from it, which makes me feel good about the work that we're doing here at Heart and Soil, heartandsoil.co. So get your meat, get your organs. If you need meat, White Oak Pastures, Belcampo, uh, all those kind of good farms, regenerative agriculture is the answer. And if you want to include plant foods, think about more toxic and less toxic plant foods. I bet that a lot of you will go to your fridge and be like, oh, broccoli, kale, spinach, throw it out. It's not what you want. Nuts and seeds, throw it out. If you want to put plant foods in there, maybe try some squash, cook the heck out of it, try some seasonal fruit, try some honey, start with those carbs and see where you go. I think those are less toxic plant foods in general. And I think they're going to open it up for a lot of people. When I describe my diet to individuals and I say, I eat meat, that's all I eat. 
They say, I could never do that. I could never just eat meat. And I say, well, I eat meat and organs. And usually they say, well, I could do that even less because nobody wants to eat organ foods, which is why we make desiccated organs. But then I say, and sometimes I eat meat or avocado or berries or squash or honey. Their eyes kind of light up and they say, maybe I could actually do that. It's a permutation of something like a paleo diet, paleo 2.0, in my opinion, it's quote, the real paleo diet, which of course is a silly thing to argue about, but it's a catchy phrase. But if your diet doesn't work in the wild, it's probably not a viable diet for humans. And I think this diet works very well in the wild. I just went out hunting last weekend. I got a deer. Of course, I'm going to eat meat and organs and fat. I did eat the brain out of that deer, which was interesting. Uh, there's no chronic wasting out there and the deer looked very healthy, but it was um, a little bit interesting. It was a little scary, but I'm sharing that with you guys. And it was delicious and I felt good afterwards. And uh, there's you know, going to be some other food out there that I'm going to have to use to eat with that deer, whether it's going to be seasonal fruit, whether I'm going to have to find some tubers that are growing out there. Those are the things I think that work in the wild. Vegan diets don't work in the wild. Vegetarian diets don't work in the wild. You can't milk animals in the wild very much. Some people will tolerate dairy. Some people won't. Um, for those who do, colostrum is a great idea if you're having GI issues. But so much of what we see being uh, suggested to us as dietary strategies just seem completely evolutionarily and anthropologically inconsistent to me. And I think if your diet doesn't work in the wild, what are the chances that 4 million years of evolution would have programmed humans to thrive on that diet? I think it's very low. So anyway, meat organs, least toxic plant foods, do that, thrive. Shoot me an email, drpaul, drpaul, heartandsoil.co. If you have questions about our products, recommendations, or you have questions about how to construct a nose to tail carnivore or carnivorous diet, I think that this is a remembering of where we've come from as humans in terms of diet. And it helps us remember that there are bigger pieces here too, community, play, sunlight, environmental hormesis, which I'll talk about more in the future. Love you guys. Thanks for being a part of this. We got nose to tail November going on at Hard and Soil. You can follow us on Instagram and stay radical. Love you guys. If you want to send me emails also with suggestions for what topics you'd like to hear, I love those. I'll see you guys soon. Podcast comes out on Tuesday. Controversial comes out. Controversial thoughts come out on Fridays and newsletters go out on Sundays. You can subscribe to the newsletter, heartandsoil.co. See you guys soon. 